I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 10th of January, 2024. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. I had a very busy morning this morning and was not able to do any planning for the show and wasn't able to get out and do any traveling around or anything uh, to get some, you know, broader like barrio walks or anything like that. So I am using this opportunity and I'm pretty excited to be doing this to Bye. test out to test out the new camera. Uh, yesterday we did a test for the show where we're using the Sony X-V1, uh, which is a vlogging camera uh, and very portable and I plan to use it for the show a lot. I'm really excited about the opportunities that that's gonna bring. This is my studio camera. This is the Fuji X-S20 and uh, this one definitely represents a level of camera we've not used on the show previously, a level of camera I've never worked with uh, previously myself and in any capacity. So I'm really excited about this. We have the Rode mic that we had yesterday Yesterday as well so I'm really interested uh, to see how today's show looks and sounds in comparison to yesterday so same mic different camera same location same time of day and uh, really looking for your guys's feedback I did a short with both yesterday because that is a bit different I'm holding it and this is I'll just mention because I will not remember later this is the Suri uh, f 1.2 23 millimeter sniper uh, cinema lens that I have on the Fuji today. So this is not a Fuji non lens. This is the uh, Suri part of the match set. I have the 33 and the 56 as well, which we'll play with at different times on the show. This is not really a setup that I got for the purpose of doing the show with this, but from doing the shorts and some stuff with it, I'm very excited uh, to see how this is going to turn out. So I get to play with it today as part of our show, uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit as a response to there's got to be something more. Scott Moore recently recently, about a week ago, left Nicaragua. I was hoping to do an interview with him before he got a chance to leave, but we've had so many things happen uh, in December and January. We didn't get to go home for Christmas because of all the things going on. I was unable to get up to Matagalpa uh, to meet with him, which I'm very sad about, but they're up in Shela, uh, Guatemala now. And he just did a video uh, about Nicaragua, and uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of a response to uh, his topic there. So we're gonna get to that right after the bump. All right, in the few minutes that we were filming there, we noticed that the camera started to overheat. So that's definitely gonna be a little bit of a problem. Uh, so this camera does an awful lot of work. This is the Fuji X-S20. This is a powerhouse of uh, video processing. This has got the giant X-Trans uh, sensor. It's got a brand new processor that is, that is doing a lot of work. Uh, and it's streaming a lot of data out to the card, doing a lot of compression. So when we do video on this, it overheats really quickly, which is always a concern with any modern camera. The Sony yesterday would overheat after about eight minutes, but this one is between two and three minutes. So that's a problem. But this one has active cooling, so we're testing out the fan, and we're gonna see how that functions because part of the plan of this camera is that be able to use it for things like concerts and the hope is that it'll be able to keep itself continuously cool. Obviously that's going to be a challenge if on a relatively pleasant afternoon when it's not in the sun that it's looking at overheating after just a few minutes. Now of course if we're doing concerts at night they should be a couple degrees cooler because they are uh, later at night and it's cooled down some but they also tend to be indoors so there's less airflow because there is wind blowing over the camera right now. Uh, it is kind of the hottest part of the day. It's about three o'clock so even though we're not in the sunlight it's certainly warmer than other parts of the days but it's not a hot day. I'm feeling quite nice being outside. So we're gonna, this is a good test to see how the heat uh, is handled, um, especially now that we've added the fan. I've never put the fan on the camera before, so that's a new thing as well. But I definitely want some feedback from you guys. I got some amazing feedback yesterday about what you thought of the Sony. Um, anytime I've used my Olympus in the past, I've gotten really good responses that people thought it looked really good. It just takes a lot of work to do. I'm hoping that this camera will lower the effort to some degree. Uh, both this and the Sony, at different, for different things, make it a lot easier for me uh, to film under different situations so that I can I can get more content that looks better or whatever now of course I don't want to use this all the time but one of the things that's nice is when I, I'm in like a place that I'm in all the time like I am right now I'm stuck filming at home today I'm able to obliterate the background and make it kind of this soft it's very attractive and soft and and it really draws focus onto the one thing that's in focus right hence the term um, so that's that's a bit interesting and um, looks more like a traditional vlogger so this is what this is actually called by a lot of people a vlogger mode um, it's a little bit silly to do this much blur to the background but this is all real blur this is caused by the lens this is not some artificial thing created by an iPhone algorithm or anything like that there's no like line around me where you're gonna see where it kind of doesn't work right like this is actual optics uh, making this beautiful effect so this is this is you know what people strive for uh, this is this is called background bokeh and uh, it does look 
really good. Uh, this is all off the Siri F1.2, so there's a lot of bokeh power uh, in this lens. So. Uh, just had this video uh, that came out, I think it was actually from this morning, but it may have been a couple days ago, from Scott Moore, who had been living in Madagalpa with his wife. Uh, they'd been here in Nicaragua for, I think, just over a year, maybe it was just under, but it's been a while, and they were viewers of this show before they moved, uh, and they lived in Madagalpa, hoping for some cooler temperatures, and now that they've moved on to northern Guatemala, just off the Mexican border in Quetzaltenango, or Shela, uh, very far north, um, they are discovering Guatemala for the first time, which is another country that I love a lot. I really enjoy uh, how close it is, and that it's easy to get up there. I went up there in 2012 uh, with Valentina, uh, who's on the show here from time to time and does the thumbnails. Um, and, and we had a really good time up there, really loved the country, really loved the city, got to see a bit of it. Um, we were only up there for uh, you know a week or two, so it wasn't, it wasn't a huge trip, but it's great that Guatemala is so accessible and I talk about it on the show a lot, um, that I'm really looking forward to our residency because that's gonna allow us to drive our car over the border and go to Guatemala very easily and Honduras and El Salvador. Um, but Guatemala especially is, is just such a big country population wise with so much to offer for the giant cities, completely different weather than here in Nicaragua, that having that be so accessible is a big deal for those of us who live down here. And uh, and I do mention that it's, it's a very different country within a very small area. It's more like states within a country because we're all part of the CA4, so we're all within a border area and uh, having them be so accessible uh, is, is very nice. It allows us to get a broader sense of place rather than being stuck only in, in one country in the region like you know Nicaragua or just stuck in Honduras uh, because we are very small countries. So if there's something you like, something you don't like, um, you tend to be just uh, worn out out a little bit by it so having ways to get flexibility is important just like if you were living in Iowa which is similar size in the United States well one of the things that makes Iowa work is that it's pretty easy to get to Missouri it's pretty easy to get to Illinois it's pretty easy to get to Nebraska and other things that border and so you have access to those cities and the differences in culture and down here everything's a little bit closer and the differences in culture are even larger because it's not little uh, states it's actually completely different countries with some different laws and different things so it's important to get that variety all right, the camera gave me a heat warning and I switched it over to the fan. Like the fan was on, but it was on auto. I turned it on to high. I can definitely hear it running. Hopefully you can't hear it running. It is quite quiet, but I can hear it and I can feel some heat blowing off the camera. So fingers crossed that that'll make a difference and keep it cool. And we had been filming in Provia. We've now moved to Osti Ostia. Uh, for those who don't know, one of the things that's really cool about Fuji cameras is that they, that they have film simulations baked into the camera. And by default, they use Provia, which is uh, Fuji's famous film stock from the 1980s, 1990s. This was the standard look of quality professional Fuji film back in the day, and they've made their camera default to creating a digital look that's very similar to that. And one of the reasons that people are very interested in Fuji cameras is their ability to provide a digital experience with a film look. And uh, they do a great job of that. And one of the things that are baked into their modern cameras is film simulations. And you have multiple film stocks that you're able to uh, emulate so you can choose very subtle looks. They're not wild and crazy. They're just you know slightly subdued colors or a slightly warmer cast or a little bit lower or higher contrast, that kind of thing. And uh, so that's something that I'm gonna be experimenting with for a while as I wanna learn how to use them. Of course, you can do log filming and, and that kind of stuff. You really advance things with the Fuji, but for those of us who are vlogging especially having access to film simulations means that the, at the twist of a dial I can have a world of very subtle but very professional looking color grades already baked in this looks like real film not like I altered something um, so it's more like I just chose a slightly different film from the classical film era uh, to shoot with rather than doing something wild as you typically see when you see color graded digital uh, footage it's you know people are going for the orange teal look or whatever which can look fantastic and you can go get a lot to do that but it's it's different than a film simulation which is looking to to recreate a authentic chemical process from the past so in there's got to be something more Scott talked about their biggest negatives of Nicaragua and a few of these I've talked about as well and so his list in some ways is very close to mine with the two really big items being the litter and trash that is all over the place both in some cases it is actual litter and in some cases it is trash that is thrown about by dogs or blown about by the wind or whatever and so it's not always litter in the littering sense of of things but there is a lot of that too and both things need to be addressed one is culturally getting people not to litter in the first place and the others to provide facilities so the trash can be taken care of so even if they don't litter it doesn't end up all over the place because there has not been 
trash facilities, right? Trash tends to go into large bins, dogs get into it, they tear it apart, it's loose, the wind picks up, blows it around. Why would you not litter when the wind is blowing trash around in the place anyway? No one can tell whether you threw it there or it blew there from the, from the wind. So you encourage a litter problem by having a trash problem. The first thing is to fix the trash problem, make sure that there are good ways to handle trash throughout the country that are not gonna turn into something that approaches litter in how it looks or feels, uh, and then go after the litter problem. The country is starting to, to tackle this, uh, but that's gonna take a lot of time, right? You gotta get a cultural movement going, you gotta get the word out, you gotta to give people the resources and you got to make it something where people feel confident shaming people who are littering and that just takes time but it'll happen and some places in the country are way ahead of others so there are places like Nagarote where they're really good about that and it is people would be embarrassed to go out and litter because uh, it's a it's a stain upon their city uh, but in other places like here in Leon there's so much litter that people do it without thinking and no one th it would be really hard to shame them oh you shouldn't do that why not everyone else does no oh, you're right everyone else does so what are you gonna do about it uh, so so it varies by location. That is a major problem and it is an opportunity for Nicaragua to leapfrog in tourism because so many tourists are, are turned away by that. That is, when, when you look at the comments on my channel and people are like, what do I dislike about Nicaragua? They're always, look at, the, look at the trash everywhere. But I grew up in the United States when there was that trash everywhere there too. So hopefully that is something that can change here just like it changed back home for me. And the other thing, and for me, this is much bigger. The trash is unfortunate, and I do wish we could change that, and it's easier to tackle. The other is the treatment of animals and all of the wild and stray and feral animals, especially dogs, but also cats and some other things that are everywhere in the country. These you see all over the place. Um, it's, it's a danger going down the road. I grew up in New York, like I say all the time. We always had to dodge white-tailed deer out on the highway, and here it is dodging dogs. And for the most part, it's amazing how much people dodge the dogs and how much the dogs actually get out of the way of moving traffic but it is a constant point of stress that you're driving down the road and there are dogs that you could hit everywhere and there's dogs on the side of the road and just the other night we were coming back from the airport and as we came through Sutiava I saw a dog lying on the side of the road and I looked over and I just thought to myself that dog is getting up and running in front of our car and it did it got up it stretched and it darted in front of the car we were ready we didn't hit it but we could have and it was stressful and that dog was just laying there why did it run in front of the car it could have just napped we could have waited for all the time there was no cars no idea what it was thinking but that kind of stuff you gotta you gotta pay really close attention if you're driving if other people are driving you're always stressed out because you're worried they're gonna hit something and and in all the time we've been here um, it, it, the number of, of animal hits that I've witnessed, at least, or I'm aware of, is very small. Um, the number of times that animals don't get hit that you thought they would is incredible. Uh, so that's, that's a bit different. Um, that, so it's important, I think, that uh, certainly the rate at which you are aware that animals are hurt on the highway is higher than other places like the U.S., but it is not as high as you might fear that it would be. Um, so that's at least a step in the right direction. Um, but the lack of spay and neuter programs, the lack of uh, public animal treatment and placement for those animals, because there just aren't homes for them, um, is heartbreaking. And especially if you're like me and, and you know, and I'm a vegetarian, um, it's, it's definitely something that's very hard to, to handle. But it also is one of the reasons that I like being in Nicaragua is that by being here, I'm, I'm a positive influence, right? I work in veterinary care. Uh, not in direct uh, hands-on with animals, but I work in the support of veterinary clinics. I work with veterinary software. I do a lot of things in the veterinary and animal care space because I'm, it's something that I care about. And uh, so by being here, one of the reasons that so many vets come here and so many vets study here is because there's a, there's a lot of opportunity to do good. And so, yes, for sure, the situation with the animals is heartbreaking. It is also something that every person who comes and is passionate about that problem can make a difference with. All right, we switched it up a little bit. We have a different lens on the camera now. We're now on the Fujinon 18-55, which has a uh, different aperture, and we're also uh, quite a bit later, so it's a lot uh, uh, darker out. I needed to take a break there for a few hours, but I did discover, because I decided to look it up. Why is the camera overheating so quickly? Um, we're also at 18 millimeters, by the way, so we get a much wider field of view, even though I'm the same distance from the camera that I was before, which is contributing to why you get to see the background so much. Actually, I want to turn this a little bit and get just a little bit more of the wildlife, meaning the dog back there. Of course, he decided to come behind me as I said that but um, there he is so I, I really like this focal length this is really nice for recording and of course I can zoom in and out if I need to using this lens so it gives me a little bit of flexibility so 
you know, all these. Just let me know what you think because I'm experimenting with this camera, but this is my new workhorse camera. Someone already did say, though, that they like the Sony better and how it looks. I'm surprised a little bit, but for sure, and that they thought it sounded better. That's where I'm really surprised. This one, I think, sounds fantastic. The Sony sounds good, but I think this is, well, I, I want to see what you guys think. So uh, with this, <laughs> obviously, I'm, I'm adding my input. Um, uh, so... Uh, it, I looked up the temperature. It was actually 95 degrees today, which is going to really annoy all of you who are in the northern United States and are in temperatures so low that your electric vehicles don't charge anymore, as we just saw in the news. Uh, you're in a blizzard, and it's 95 in the middle of the day, which is funny because I said it's so pleasant, which really shows just how much we've adapted from living here. But it's worth noting, the humidity today was 43%, which is a pretty dry, again, not a desert by any stretch, but 43% humidity at 95 degrees is very pleasant, warm, but very pleasant but cameras are affected by the temperature not the humidity humans especially me are more affected by the humidity than the temperature but you will notice that at 95 no sweat doing quite well like i really am comfortable i don't need to be in air conditioning or anything my office is air conditioned but like i'm out doing stuff even in the sunlight no problem now now it's come down a little bit it's probably no more than 91 92 and tonight it will get down as low as 77 but when we normally do recording at uh events um it, the t the time that, that would be about 9 p.m tonight we're supposed to be at 81 but 95 to 81 a 14 degree drop plus 81 would be the hottest during the concert it would drop to 77 that's really not bad. So I'm, I'm really interested to see how the camera is able to hold up under those conditions. At 95 degrees, it really has very little cooling potential to work with, but at 81, it has so much more. So if all goes well, uh, it will be able to do much better. It really, we really are pushing it pretty hard today. Okay, so to, to uh, respond to Scott Moore's video, which I need to get to before it overheats again and times out, of course, and before I lose all of my light. Um, so his, his one point, the thing about the litter, absolutely, and then the dogs. It is heartbreaking with the dogs, um, and, and it's, you know, a real tragedy, but, and then I can't overstate how terrible that is. But that, you, as I, as I have my dogs behind me, it's obvious that this is, I'm an animal lover. My dogs are very central to uh, my existence. And <clears throat> in, in this, right, you have an opportunity in coming, if I back up, they get more in focus. Oh, and they run away. You have an opportunity to make a difference, right? By coming here, you can, you know, treat dogs better. Be an example of someone who treats animals better. Uh, go out of your way to be involved in spay and neuter programs uh, and get involved with helping communities with their animals, all kinds of things, right? You have an opportunity to make a difference culturally, financially, directly rescuing animals, whatever. You can be a positive impact. And so on one side, it's yes, I want to bury my head in the sand and not have to see terrible things happening because I can't just snap my fingers and save them all. I understand. So that's that's something you have to decide. Is the, How is that going to affect you? Is this something that you, you can't handle knowing that that's what's happening and 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 you'd rather rather not, you know, be there because of it? And, and I totally understand. Like, it's very difficult for me to see all the wild dogs, although it's also worth noting some of the things he said, like, oh, the cows are so skinny. Well, they're, that's not actually, oh, with the cows, that's not actually true. They're eating a lot of grass. They're not lacking in food. That is what a healthy cow that isn't force fed over too much food, like in the US, looks like. So the cows are a different story. The dogs are really, you know, they're begging. They don't have a lot of good food sources in the cities. So a lot of times you're seeing unhealthy dogs uh, or very skinny dogs. Um, it is uh, coming from North America where the people and the animals tend to be quite overweight. Um, it, it is a little bit misleading. Uh, just <laughs> look how pretty she's being. Um, it's over. It, it's a little bit misleading uh, what it's like, but it is heartbreaking. And they they do want more food, and you should feed them table scraps and, and put out food and leave water out. Like at my place on the beach, we have flowing water that we leave at all times for the for the dogs, and they'll come into the restaurant and they know they've got a bunch of water and they know they're safe there and they can get fresh water because it comes from the well, right? Um, is always available for them and things like that, very important. I know when I lived in the city in Labo Rio, right, our neighbors took, they cut the top off of a milk jug and strapped the bottom of a milk jug to a post and, and fill it with water so the dogs in the neighborhood as they came down the sidewalk would come and get fresh water there. People do some of that stuff, you could do that stuff, you could be a positive contributing factor and make a difference. So 
you know, look at it, it's the same way that people look at Nicaragua and say, oh, the poverty, right? Oh, it's so hard to be around the poverty. Great. You don't want poverty in Nicaragua. You can help make it go away. You're not going to make it all go away, obviously, unless you're like, you know, Bill Gates, you could totally make it all go away. But normal people are not going to be able to make it all go away. But normal North Americans, normal Western Europeans can make some of it go away. You can identify individual people, give them jobs that take them out of poverty. You can give educational opportunities that give them out of poverty. And even if you don't have the means or the desire or the will or the strength to directly contribute in a direct way, that's okay. By being here, you contribute to pulling people out of poverty. Maybe not, maybe not completely reducing uh, uh, an individual person's poverty, but you are making a positive impact by cr um, helping to create jobs, by raising the profits on businesses, by keeping more people employed, whether you're shopping at the grocery store, shopping at the market, one way or another, your food supply, um, all the services, your housing, all those things are coming from this market. And by being here, spending that money, you can hear the dogs rolling around like maniacs behind me. Uh, by being in the market, by doing all these things, you are putting that money that you would otherwise just waste in, in a market where it doesn't make any difference. And instead putting it into a place where uh, those, those little bits of spends that you're doing may make a noticeable positive impact uh, on the environment, on the economy, and people are able to uh, create more jobs, hire more people, do more business because of that. And, and even someone who is not intentionally doing anything for the economy, just being here, uh, I'm liking what this camera lets me do. It does, it does give me some flexibility, I like it. Um, by being here, you automatically contribute in a way that is impactful. Some people contribute in a way that's massively impactful, and some people contribute simply by being here in a way that's minimally impactful. But unless you're doing something to damage the environment by being here, by spending your, your savings, your retirement, your uh, foreign income, whatever it is, by spending that here on housing, on food, on services, any of those things, you are positively making a difference to pull people out of poverty maybe just a little bit across the entire uh, uh, population, maybe very specific people, depending on what you're doing. But like with the animals, these are positive impacts that you can have. And so while you can see these things as a negative, and they certainly are, they can be really important reasons why you may want to choose Nicaragua is because you can help reduce litter, you can help promote anti uh, or good trash management programs, you can petition for those things, you can help be a good example of how to treat animals and, and sponsor spay and neuter programs, you can spend your money here and contribute to reducing poverty. Those are all ways that you directly make a difference if that's what's important to you and reasons why you don't want to avoid coming to Nicaragua for the reasons that you could have made a good difference. One benefit to this camera is that it handles the low light way better than any camera I've ever had before. So at this particular time, if I was recording with the GoPro, for example, which I normally do, that's what I use the bulk of the time, it would look absolutely terrible and you'd be like, Ugh, I don't want to watch. And this should be looking pretty good. It is quite late. Uh, the sun has gone down and this is the uh, blue hour light and it still seems pretty good. I switched back to the standard profile because it handles low light just a tiny bit better. If I needed to, I could even do settings in like F-Log or in a higher dynamic range to actually extract a little bit more out of the image, but I think that the Fuji's going to handle this pretty well. And this lens that I'm on is only an f2.8. I've got the 1.2, so I'm not even trying that out for this. So we can test that in some future uh, episode right now, I think this is going to work just fine. All right, so the other, sorry, this is a very interruptive uh, video. It's been a very complicated day here. We've had so much going on and with the new cat, there's just a lot going on and it's, it's tough to get through the video. All right, Scott also mentioned uh, a couple things. One is that uh, they weren't super happy. They were hoping for better weather or better weather for them here in Nicaragua. And the locations that they went to, Matagalpa is generally very nice, right? Very cool temperatures for Nicaragua, still very warm compared to most places. Uh, and they spent some time in Corinto. And the thing that he mentioned was he was surprised by the humidity. And I think this is worth a quick mention. If you've seen his video, right, Corinto is part of the Chinandega area, which is the hottest city in Nicaragua. It's actually the hottest city 
often it's considered the hottest city in Latin America, right? So this is an example of an extremely hot city and it is humid there. It's not like here in Leon, we're pretty close, look at a map, but when you go to, Le uh, go to Chinandega, you feel the heat and you feel the humidity change. It's a little bit more coastal and just the way that it sits, what, I don't know what does it, but it's warmer than here by a noticeable amount. Both Chinandega and its northern uh, satellite city of El Viejo are famous throughout Nicaragua for just how brutally hot they are, even compared to Leon, which is considered a hot city. But we're a hot and relatively dry city. I don't think Chinandega really gets the same level of dry. It's not a humid city, but it's more humid than here. But Corinto, which is coastal, is going to be more humid than Chinandega. So when you go to Corinto, you're talking about the hottest coastal town, to the best of my knowledge, in all of um, Central America. So that's going to give you a, a relatively humid and definitely very warm experience. If you're looking for something cool, that was the farthest thing from it you could do. Now I realized they were not there because they said, well, I think this is going to be good. They're there because his wife's family is from Corinto, right? So they're visiting family and stuff, but it's giving them like when they visit family, they're getting this really hot, humid experience, which is not what they're looking for. And then going back to Madagalpa, I was surprised by their expect expectation of this because Madagalpa's claim to fame is that it's the city in the cloud forest. So while it has reasonably mild temperatures and it's a beautiful city that I love a lot, it is extremely humid. It is rainy and foggy all the time and like you're in the clouds, like you have really high humidity. So. Uh, that's uh, that could I think could have been a better choice. I think uh, Hinotega and Esteli are both drier, uh, but but still pretty humid. When you get up into those mountains, because of where they sit, they just they just have very high humidity. Um, so that's that's to be expected in these mountains. I'm sure in other parts of the range, parts of Panama, parts of Guatemala, you're probably going to get much drier mountain uh, areas. This particular area, it is the 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 rainforest comes right up against the mountains, and so you have a lot of humidity coming up and then mixing in that area and then it doesn't make it down here into the lowlands on the west in the pacific lowlands uh it is the caribbean lowlands that hold the humidity and then that mountain range the spine through the country gets a fair amount up in the mountains so if you're looking for a low humidity environ those towns even though their temperatures are much more mild are not going to be well suited for that. So that's something that they discovered. If you if you watch this channel, just be aware that that's an important thing to understand. Those are very humid cities. There are places in Nicaragua that are a little bit cooler, a little bit drier. If you're looking for cool and dry, this is not the right country for you, right? So so that's what they discovered and that's an important thing. And they're on this journey of discovery across all of Latin America. So they're which is really cool. And if you watch uh, generic expats uh, that uh, recently interviewed me and interviewed Scott, uh, he is also doing all of Latin America. I am attempting to do all of Latin America, but I'm doing it based out of Nicaragua. They are both wandering. Uh, Eric is kind of wandering, and I don't know that it's going to be his permanent home. Maybe it is, I'm not sure, but I don't know that he knows, uh, but that's not necessarily in his goals. With Scott and his wife, their goal is to wander across Latin America and discover where is going to be their permanent home. I have done a bunch of Latin America. Nicaragua is my permanent home, but I want to spend a lot more time across Latin America and bring more of it to you, both on this channel and in some other endeavors, uh, but I'm really passionate about the region. And I absolutely love Guatemala, where they are currently staying, um, and they already determined that Guatemala is on their current shortlist, which I think it should be on the shortlist for a lot of people, and they feel that Nicaragua is off their current shortlist, which I think for a lot of people it should be, I mean, if you've already done it, they know that it's not for them, then they know, right? But if it's something you're looking at, it should be on your short list because the kinds of things that people find to be uh, unique about it, right, are relatively unique. Nicaragua has a lot of very strong offerings. Lower cost of living, very solid, reliable, warm temperature, incredibly stable government. Right now, Guatemala is in the middle of a potential overthrow of their government. They, they literally are deciding right now whether they're going to continue being a democratic nation or not. That is actually where Guatemala is. They're in the middle of constant protest. Um, all of my people that are up there, anytime I have someone doing something in Guatemala, they're being impacted by that. I have a team that's up there right now, um, not doing anything for the show, but people that I work with are in Guatemala and dealing with that, right? Roads are closed down, cities are closed down. People are pretty worried because there's a lot of political upheaval going on in Guatemala right this moment. And um, unlike Guatemala, where there's a lot of 
this kind of stuff going on, right? They're in that um, heavy churn political world with the U.S. where there's a lot of outside influence going on. And so they just they just have a very uh, high disparity range within how their, their politics tend to go. One of the benefits here in Nicaragua is an extremely stable system. Um, and so you have a lot more predictability, a lot less worries over the, the long span um, about what's going to happen. Every country in the Americas, every country in the world really has upheaval, right? And so that's something you just have to accept. A lot of Americans have have gone through a really big period of, of really strong stability, for the most part, um, post-Civil War until now. Now the United States is considered one of the least stable uh, countries in the Western Hemisphere. It is an absolute powder keg ready to go off, and everyone in the U.S. has recognized that. It is unstable to the most extreme degrees, um, <clears throat> and so a, a very long period of stability is leading to a lot of panic uh, instability. Whereas, say, Guatemala, who is currently quite unstable, um, I'm also not worried about going there. Right? I'm worried that my traffic might get interrupted. If I'm on vacation, I may not be able to uh, make it to dinner or get to the city I was planning on right on schedule. That kind of worry? Yes. Am I worried that it's dangerous or some terrible thing's going to happen? No. I hope that good things happen for the people of Guatemala. It's a wonderful country. I hope to invest up there. I want to be involved more. But I don't think those things are something that's I'm worried about having go wrong. I don't think the culture is going to change, uh, but um, I, don't, I don't worry about going there. If you said right now I got to go up there and, and do some work, I'd be like, great, I've been looking forward to going, let's go, right? And no worries at all. But the same thing to the United States. I'm like, I'd really rather not be there. I feel very uncomfortable, right? I feel like this is at any moment I could be in a situation where it's extremely dangerous and, you know, not likely, but the chances of something bad happening where borders are closed, you're trapped, uh, all kinds of like really scary things happen. Nowhere is scarier than the U.S. right now. There's no country in the Western Hemisphere except for Haiti. I have to grab the tripod. The dogs are so crazy that they're going to knock over the camera. So I'm b being a little bit different. The, the little dog is hiding between my feet so that the big one doesn't get him. Uh, so you know, there's no other country except for Haiti in the Western Hemisphere where I would have those worries currently. Like, there's places that have a lot of political stuff going on, Guatemala, for example, but none of them are scary. The U.S. is actually scary, and Haiti has a bit that is scary, too. And now I know some of my viewers are in Haiti. I've been told, like, the city's got some problems, but most of Haitian countryside is really not that bad, which is really interesting. I would love to go to Haiti and explore some of that. Um, not on the cards or right at the exact moment, but I would absolutely go to Haiti uh, and bring more of the show to you there. I just need the budget for that, right? So we'll see. Um, so but some of those things, right? Like there, there's a lot that Nicaragua has to offer someone who's looking to come here that other countries in the region just don't offer uh, to the same degree. So that's important, but there's a lot of things about Nicaragua that people may not like and the trash, the dogs, uh, some of those things, those, those are significant and the heat is real. So things to be aware of. And of course we can't claim that there's no problem with the heat when the camera has overheated as many times as it has during today's show. Okay, so that's that's one piece. The other thing that he talked about was the healthcare. And this he was very split on. He's like, he had some really good experiences, and some really bad ones. And it was kind of divided that his healthcare healthcare uh, was pretty good and his dental healthcare was not. And um, so this, this brought up a couple of thoughts for me um, in, in this discussion. One is, Anywhere you go, there's going to be an opportunity for bad healthcare. Like that's always potential. Um, and I don't know if the process that they used for looking for a dentist was great. They used like the family that had been here for a long time. This is just who they knew and had always used. That can be good because you get a lot of references for that. Um, when we came here, like when we looked for a dentist, we talked to a large number of people. Everybody recommended the same person and it was someone young and it was based on, you know, they, they have this amazing practice. They do this great job. Uh, and she's been on my show. Um, and our dentist is absolutely amazing. And one of the things is that the, uh, and this is, this is important, I think, not, not that you should limit who you choose for healthcare based on this, but it's a really good factor. And that is consistently every American that we know that comes and gets dental care here goes, oh my gosh, I will never get dental care in America again because it is so bad compared to here. They don't care about the price. They're complaining about the quality of dental care. People who have had tons of doctors spent outrageous amounts of money in the United States to have dental care done, then come here, just get a cleaning and get a, why is your mouth all messed up? We gotta fix this. And they just fix it, same day, 
right? And actually do things, things that months or years of work and tons of money in the United States, people didn't even address, didn't tell them about, nothing. Here, just gets fixed and it's $20, right? The fact that it's cheap, well, that's just a bonus, right? But the fact that it was, there was a doctor able to just fix things, whereas in the United States, even specialist after specialist after specialist were unable to do what seems to be pretty basic dentistry, right? So the, what they've discovered is that the quality of care available here outstrips what is available in the United States. If you go from doctor to doctor to doctor, you may not be able to get quality care in the US and here they were able to find it with ease. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't accidentally end up with a bad dentist. Of course you could, in both locations. It's the, could you find a good one? Here, it seems pretty reliable. In the US, I don't know. I've never had a dentist that I pushed to the point where I knew if it was good or bad. Um, and the description that he had of the cleaning is not what the dentists are like here in Leon. So that seems like a weird kind of one-off thing. I don't know. Now, you know, it, medical care is difficult because people perceive it differently. People have different experiences. Um, but specifically, incredible high quality dental care being available, maybe not the average, but available, is a reason for coming to Nicaragua. Even if you don't plan to live here, just come here for dental care. That's like a big thing, right? Like this is a hot spot for dental care because you can get care so far beyond what the US will do. So that's, that's an interesting thing that that was the spot where they ran into problems, um, but uh, you know, I know that we didn't talk about it and that's something that we have resources, like we have found really good dentists. So if you um, don't get a broad range of uh, recommendations, I, it probably is pretty easy to end up with someone who's, you know, may seem okay to someone who's not shopping around. If it's a family dentist, right? Maybe it's uh, the only thing they know. So they don't have a point of reference from another dentist. Like that's, I, I thought this is what dentistry was like, right? He didn't screw up their teeth. It was just, he didn't like them as a dentist. Like he didn't feel they did that great of a job. So if you were not shopping around, if you're not familiar with other dentists, you may just think that's how dentists are and he didn't like rip them off or anything he you know whatever um, so it's a it's a different way of looking at recommendations that brought me to the thought and this is kind of what I really wanted to have as a point of the video was not so much to critique or respond to specifically the things that Scott had said although for the most part uh, most of them I agree with uh, or at least to some degree it's um, it's that when coming to, and this is true for any country, but I think Nicaragua is much more acute, is much more exacerbated, extreme, in how this plays out. And that is, when you're moving to a new country, when especially when you're moving to a Nicaragua, and especially when you're coming from like an America where the, the space, like if you're coming from Honduras, it won't be a big deal. If you're coming from America, like the disparity is so big in the everyday stuff. Everything is different. And we've talked about this a bit on the show. Everything is different that you do from minute to minute. The way that you pay your bills, the way you go to the grocery store, the way you pick up a car, like get a car, hire a car to drive you, the way that you uh, order food at a restaurant, every little thing, right, is very different. And of course, people accept that. No one's like, ah, it's not, it's a, what? No, everyone's cool with that. But I think when I see uh, people who are doing evaluations of Nicaragua, and um, I've had some people on my channel, they've come and they're like, oh, it's awful, I hate it, I can't believe people go there. Um, and you'll see, like we had this discussion of this one person who tried to claim you would need to be a millionaire to live here. He had had this isolated experience and somehow got the impression, or claimed to have the impression, we don't know, that you couldn't live here for less than three to $10,000 a month. Which of course, those of us who live here on much smaller budgets are like, well, obviously we can prove that that's not the case and what were you doing? And we never got an answer as to what he was doing, right? People ask me all the time, did he ever follow up and tell you where all this money went? No, there's never been any, any reasonable explanation of anything other than someone said they needed lots of money. Literally, just someone said they needed lots of money. They didn't say where it needed to go. They didn't say why. They didn't give any like shock, like, oh, it's 10 times what other people make. Why would you need that? Nothing, right? They just acted like crazy amounts of money were okay. In these cases, that's an extreme case, right? But in other cases where I've seen when you really dig into what their experience was and they say like, oh, this thing was awful, that thing was awful. And I'm sure that they were, right? Uh, we're assuming this isn't someone who's lying about it, right? That happens too. We get those posts, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who are being genuine. And, and there's lots of them. And there's, you know, any new country you come to, you're gonna get lots of people who genuinely don't love it, right? It's gonna happen. Doesn't matter what country you are, right? US, Nicaragua, anywhere in between, somebody is gonna not enjoy being there. It's just how it is, right? But someone is gonna love all of them. Someone loves America as their favorite place to be. Someone loves Nicaragua as their favorite place to be. Someone loves Guatemala as their favorite place to be, right? And all the other countries 
too. So that's one of the great things about the variety we have in humanity, right? Is that we have lots of people, like lots of different things. We have lots of choices for them. So that's fantastic. But when I find the majority, it seems like when people are really unhappy, not like, so Scott's good, right? He's like, well, it was too warm and too humid, but I really like the people. Like, it seems like a very reasonable assessment. They gave it a long time. It wasn't like just a month. Um, they really tried to find a right location. They did probably find one of the best locations that they found my favorite city, right? And it wasn't cool enough. It wasn't dry enough, right? Those things really affected them. And, and maybe they didn't know how much that would affect them, right? That's one thing that people tend to learn when you move to a new climate. Sometimes you're like, yeah, this will be fine. And then you find out it's not, or you think it's gonna be terrible and you find out it's fine, right? Like I moved to Leon terrified of how hot it was going to be gave it a try, but I was really worried about how hot it was going to be. And honestly, it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I would like it cooler. Yes, if that was a checkbox, I would take cooler. But I love living in Leon and the heat is not a showstopper in any way. And like I said, it was 95 today. It's still pretty warm. I'm not getting sweaty out here. It's pretty comfortable. So like you adapt, but you didn't know you were going to adapt or you can't adapt and you thought you would, right? So these things, sometimes you just have to learn about yourself, not just about the climate you're going to. Um, so that that's a really very reasonable, very measured response. But a lot of the people who are very unhappy, they seem to be one, not giving it enough time for things to adjust. So they, they never learn how things work. They never understand what they're seeing, right? If you were to just fly from Nicaragua to the United States and drive around, you'd be completely confused, right? These people all live in mansions. They must be rich. Well, no, they're, you know, strapped trying to make their payments. They're struggling to put food on the table. They're not able to get high quality food that you're able to get. They can't afford to go out to the bar and drink a beer every night like you are. Oh my gosh, you're describing someone who's really poverty stricken, but they live in these mansions. Yes, America tends to be activity poor and property rich. And Nicaragua tends to be activity rich and property poor. It's, and so when you're looking from one to the other, you only see the property. You can't see the activities. And so one thing makes it look much more expensive, much richer than it is. And the other makes it look much poorer than it is. And it, and it can be very confusing, right? So like things like that, right? Taking time to learn how to use the grocery store, taking time to develop relationships with a good doctor and a good dentist. And for example, in Scott's case, he hasn't been here enough time necessarily for as little dental care, presumably as he's needed, that he didn't need to bother reaching out and really looking for another dentist and figuring out what other people do and whatever. He just had a little bit that he needed to do on the time that he tried it out. It wasn't the best. And he doesn't know if that, you know, he doesn't doing a big survey of dentists. Um, so, you know, in his case, had he decided to stay here, he would eventually have started reaching out being like, okay, I got to find a different dentist. And then he would discover after a little bit of effort guaranteed that, wow, if you find a good dentist, they're really good here. Right. And really affordable still. Um, but, uh, but if you're only doing a quick sampling, you don't know. Right. And so the people who are often unhappy, I'm finding they're only here for weeks or months. They never settle down. They never did the research and they never are really um, taking the effort to acclimate both socially and climatically, right? You have to give it at least three months to even have a, a first clue of whether or not you're going to adjust climatically. And for me, six months, suddenly it was like, wait, it's not that bad, but it was like a shock, right? It wasn't like, it wasn't like suddenly one day it, it was, uh, oh, I acclimated. It was one day I realized I had acclimated sometime before, and now I didn't have those problems. Very strange. Right now we're constantly amazed because we can remember how hot it was. And it's like, we go to restaurants and things and it's, we don't even notice the temperature. I forget that you might want a fan. Like all that stuff has gone away. I still like it when there's a fan, but I forget to ask for one. Right. And, and so those, those kinds of things, it takes time and you got to get to know what you're looking at. You got to understand how to go out, how to interact with people. Right. We had someone who came only stayed for like two weeks, was so excited about coming here, got here, only went out like two times, never gave, you know, well, I don't have any friends. Well, of course not. You never went out. Who would you make friends with? You didn't talk to anybody. You didn't, you're not learning Spanish. You're not going to events. And just going to the bar and listening to live music is fun. It's cool. How many people are you going to meet? A few, maybe, for sure. But tons? No. You got to go different places, do different things, find activities uh, that you want to do, and you will make friends organically if you put yourself out there. But if you only give it two weeks and never leave your house uh, or only go to the gym or something, where are you going to meet people? Where are you going to make friends? And friends take time, right? So if you give it time, right? You tend to uh, acclimate in a completely different way where you start to get a feel for the place and all these little things 
that, yes, the transition is painful, right? How do I pay my electric bill? Okay, okay, we got you. So here, you're just gonna go to the Super Express. Where's that? Okay, down the street, on the left, there, okay, what do I do there? Because it, there's no like obvious, put your money here. Nope, you gotta walk up, give them this thing. How do you know this stuff? Well, the people who grew up here know it. It's just how things work. When you're moving here, you don't have this context. You don't have this history. You don't have parents teaching you. You don't have friends telling you. You're not watching other people doing it. You're not listening to them do it every time you go to the store because you don't speak Spanish, right? All these little things make it really, really hard when you're moving. But once you get past that learning curve, then suddenly it's like, oh gosh, finding a doctor is easy. Finding a dentist is easy. Getting references is easy. Paying the bills is easy. In many cases, easier than where you're coming from but it was only, it seemed easier where you were because it's what you were used to. You were brought up to do it. You, you watch people do it your whole life. I know how to write checks and go to an American bank. It's so easy because I grew up doing it all the time as a kid. If I went out with no context now and you said, oh, you got to write a check, go to a bank, do a bank, I'd be like, I don't understand how any of this works. None of this is in my, my context since I was 20 years old. It's all from before I was 20 years old, right? Someone do, if I asked my kids to do it, they'd be like, all of this is foreign. I have no idea what's going on. Um, and, and I think that it's a challenge that you have to understand when you're looking at a new place that you have to give it both quite a bit of time uh, or you have to really, really evaluate which things are going to go away, which things are not actually problems, but they're just, they seem like problems because you haven't adjusted yet, right? You haven't adjusted to the climate. You haven't adjusted to how things work. You haven't created a group of friends yet and there, you don't have the references for things. When you have friends, it's like, oh man, I need a dentist. Oh, I got, I got 20 friends who could tell me which dentist they like and which ones they don't, just like that. That's how I found the dentist that we have, right? Everyone I knew, every time you ask someone casually, oh, you know, someday I'm gonna need a dentist. Do you, do you have one? Everybody said the same person. Oh, this person, well, I, I shopped around until I found this person, right? And that is like two or three that people are like that. And now we have a really amazing dentist and a really amazing orthodontist, right? And, uh, uh, and our orthodontist, their sister makes our coffee, right? So like we have an ecosystem of things. And those things, you, you either have to put in the time and then evaluate a place based on this is how well I actually fit into it, or you have to very carefully isolate those things and be like, okay, I have to imagine if I was going out with friends to this bar, would we have a good time? Will I make friends here? Do I want to do the things that will make friends here? If I, right, if I do whatever, pick the thing, you know, if I, if I knew how to pay these bills easily, would it still bother me? Would I be like, oh, cool. I know how to pay these bills. No effort whatsoever, right? That's how it is now for us, right? But we had to put in quite a bit of time. We had to make friends. We had to learn how to do these things. And it's, it, it's an effort. And you're going to find this effort exists no matter where you want to move. This is one of the reasons why people choose enclaves. If you're moving to uh, the, on, the, the famous American enclave in Panama, if you're moving to Boquete, if you're moving to San Juan del Sur, you can skip a lot of this stuff. You're going to be surrounded by people from your own culture who are going to be able to tell you all the things you need to do, all the things they do, uh, walk you through it all, and it won't be the same as what Nicaraguans do. It won't be the same as what we do up here in Leon, but it'll get you through without this, this huge curve. There'll be some curve, right? It's not gonna be zero, but it's gonna be this real minor one that you're like, this is so easy, except for the climate. That will still, that you can't speed that up, right? But that's, enclaves really bring a lot of value. You get to move to a new place. You give up some of the advantages of, the, of that new place in exchange for giving up some of the pain of transition. And plus you get to keep whatever you know culture it is that you're looking for. You want to keep the one that you're from, you find an enclave that's from where you're from, and you say, well, I don't wanna change this. I like the stuff I do, because that's why you do it, right? In many cases, not always. So you want those things, that's, that's how you do that. But if you want to fully take advantage of Nicaragua and the culture that it has and the opportunities that it has and the, all those things, it's gonna be really hard to do really quickly. It's one of the reasons that I encourage people to move early and a few times, try some different places. But this is something we don't really mention very often is how much you need to evaluate what the learning curve is and how much it's impacting you. Either you have to wait it out and get past that learning curve and evaluate the place in reality, very hard to do who has that time a few of you but not it's like you can do that right but it's very hard to do um, and you can only do it to so many places or you have to much more quickly um, learn how to separate the emotions of I don't know what to do I'm panicking because I don't have friends I'm panicking because I don't know how to make a, a bill payment I'm panicking because I, I can't 
hear the language easily, or I don't know how to count the bills, or I don't know what things should cost, right? Those things will get fixed and relatively quickly, right? Not, not weeks, but some, the curve will not be that bad, right? You'll start being able to hear things. You'll start being able to count the money. You'll know how much things should cost. You'll know what's, what's normal. Uh, you'll start to have friends who can tell you things. And, and once you do that, um, you can gauge all those things much more easily. But learning to identify which things are just your emotional response um, or, or there are things you just haven't and you can say, you know what, paying the electric bill won't be hard. I don't know what the answer is, but I know that all these millions of people who live around here are all paying their electric bill, and if it was hard, that would be a problem. That's, that's not what's going on. I just don't know how to do it. I'm gonna figure that out, and once I do, this whole thing that's bothering me, gone, what's the next thing to knock out, right? And, and in doing that, I think you can um, evaluate a place better. Um, and it's also important to remember if you're going from places that are related. Now, I hate using this term because it's kind of unfair to be like, oh, this place is similar to this one, but let's be fair, it's true, right? If you are used to the US, Canada isn't so hard, but if you're coming directly from Nicaragua and going to Canada, you've never been to the US, it's much harder. But if you go to the US first and then go to Canada, you're like, okay, they're different, but they're not that different. There's a whole bunch of things that are shared between them, not just the language. but that that would ease the transition and the same thing here if you're living in nicaragua and you're like oh, this is so hard and then you move to honduras or costa rica some of the it's easier is that you're already going to have learned a bunch of things that translate pretty well and so if you start anywhere in the region we started in panama trust me i remember this really hard learning curve in panama by the time we moved to nicaragua it was that much easier right because they are similar in a lot of ways a lot of cultural things cross over even though they also have some really big differences panama is much more like nicaragua than the u.s is right it was a step towards nicaragua and that's one of the reasons we picked panama was because it was a easing our way into latin america as americans costa rica would do the same thing in a slightly different way that would allow you to get into the region without a huge leap all at once and then moving to someplace like nicaragua was even easier than going to Panama uh, but that gave us a little bit lower of a learning curve when we got here and uh, and having lived in both places then coming back to when we came back to Nicaragua it was super easy we we felt like there was just you know we yeah we did have to figure out some of the long-term things that we didn't have to do before but we knew that we could get those resources we knew how to find the things that we needed and it really wasn't too bad so that doesn't give you a great answer. Like, there's no magic like, oh, so what do I do? Just check this box and I didn't know to check that box, we're good. No, what I'm saying is getting to know a place is hard and you need to uh, carefully separate the, I haven't actually figured it out yet. And that makes me worried. It makes me uh, cautious. It makes me um, um, suspicious of things. It makes me see things in a negative light because when I see the people who are having problems, uh, that they do, that they don't like it and they're telling me oh I had this problem I had that problem I'm like wow no one I know who lives here has those problems right but they're reasonable problems they're not like I don't believe you they're just like hmm so what's causing these problems and most of the time it's a few things sometimes it's they don't like the place because they had problems and if I had had those problems I may not like it either right that's that's legit but in many cases I think what's happening is when I look at it I'm like wow I would not have handled this situation this way but why wouldn't I have? Well, because I've been here long enough that I kind of have a good idea of how things work and I would have known this wasn't a good way to do it, right? Or I would have had this resource because I'm here and I would have used that resource. And, and this is, right, if you live in the United States, we don't tend to use resources in that way. Here, if you're living in Nicaragua, one of the things that makes it livable is creating an ecosystem of friends and, and resources that you can use when you need them. That's just how life is here. Uh, and that's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just different. And if you don't have those resources, which everyone who's been here for a while does, once you've been here for six months or whatever, you're going to start assembling this team of people that you need, right? I know where to go for this. I know who to ask about this I know, whatever. It becomes way easier to, to live here. And, um, that just takes a little bit of time. And if you don't have that time, you haven't done that yet, you won't have those resources. So when I see people having problems at customs, see people having problems with buying a house, see people having problems with all these little things, and they say, oh, it was a terrible experience. Well, I've had bad experiences here too, but they're, they're lost in a sea of good ones. And if you're only here for a little bit, 
well, if you get those bad ones first, that's all you're gonna have is reference. You're not gonna have the good ones to offset it, so that's one thing. But the other thing is, is that because I have these resources, because I have this experience, I know how to react, I've put in the time to uh, assimilate to, to some degree, I'm in a really good position so when bad things happen, I can handle it better. I know they're only gonna get so bad. I know what, you know, I have a much better view of them. I have way better deal uh, chance of, of dealing with them well and they're less likely to happen to me. So a lot of those times where people are just like, ah, oh, this terrible thing, that terrible thing, I'm like, I feel like if I had been there, this would have not been a major problem. It would have been like, oh, minor inconvenience, whatever. Or I just, oh, I went to the wrong line. I'm gonna go to this line, fix that, that kind of stuff. And uh, that's not always true but I think quite a bit of the time uh, that it is, and um, that's an important part of your evaluation toolkit for any country, right? I don't have the resources to know what I did wrong here. I need someone who's lived here to guide me, and this probably would not have been a big deal. Anyway, it is super dark out here. I'm loving how this is looking on the camera, so uh, the camera monitor, so we're gonna see how this turns out. Let me know overall about this video, how it looks and stuff. Always get down below, leave your comments. I appreciate all the comments that we get. Today was a rough day, so this is not a great indicator of what the camera is like overall. This is super dark. No other camera I have would even be recording anything worth getting right now, so I'm really thankful for this new camera, but we're gonna experiment with a bunch of lenses, a bunch of cameras, learn what works, what's better, figure out what we can take out in the field. Mostly we'll be back to the GoPro most of the time. Uh, this is for other things. I do, I changed it to the higher temperature uh, limits and it cooled down a little bit because the sun went down and it has recorded now for quite some time. So I am thinking we're on a good path. And I read while it was cooling down at one point that if I hook up an external uh, recorder, which is like a thousand dollars, so I'm not ready to just do that and there's none sold in the country. So I've got to get one in the US and bring it in, but supposedly that will cool the system down as well or spread out where the heat comes from anyway uh, and, and should it give me much better results. So I'm hopeful that with a few little tweaks and there's a rumor that Fuji's gonna bring out built in uh, SSD support, so you just plug in through the USB port and record directly to um, an SSD. That's only a rumor. It is definitely not available yet. I tested. But if that becomes available, that will probably fix things as well. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you could take a moment and share this on social media, tell friends, family about the show, I would appreciate it very much. We are always trying to grow the show. This is a major commitment that we make to this. And if you would like to sponsor the show, of course, that would mean a lot to all of us here. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to us and helps make the new cameras and computers and all that stuff possible so that we're able to bring you a more robust show. Thanks for joining me. I will see all of you tomorrow.